Hello learners. In this lecture, we will see the other basic ingredients that is required for the cement and also its uses. So in the previous lecture, we had seen up to the importance of lime. And now we'll try to see what is the importance of the silica. Now you can see it here. Siliceous compounds are mainly responsible for the strength of the cement. And we also seen that the percentage of the silica should be in between 17 to 25 percent. Now, again, the same question that comes up in our mind. What happens if the percentage of silica is more than 25 percent? So that means what is going to happen if you're going to put axis of silica? The first thing is that it will retard the setting of a cement, but the strength gain is going to happen. That means the strength gain is going to happen. Whatever strength you're supposed to get that you're going to have that you're going to get. But the thing is that the retard the setting of a cement. What do you mean by retard? Retard is to take more and more time in the setting of a cement. See, in the upcoming lectures, we'll be seeing what is the initial setting time of a cement? What is the final setting time of a cement? So usually the initial setting time of a cement should not be less than 30 minutes. That means once we prepare a cement paste or let us say even a concrete, if you're going to prepare, at least it should take more than 30 minutes for the cement to start to gain its strength. So if you try to add more and more, uh, you know, silica, what will happen? It will retard the setting of a cement. That means the cement that is supposed to get set by 45 or let us say 50 minutes, it will go up to let us say one hour or two hour. So I would, I don't want that to happen, right? So that is why we have to try to keep the uh, silica content in between 17 to 25%. If you're trying to increase it, it will retard the setting of a cement, but the strength gain that you're supposed to get that you're going to get. The second point is that it will not impart any unsoundness unlike lime since no compounds of silica will react with water. That means if you remember uh, in the lime, what used to happen, uh, there was an unsoundness, right? Because due to the change in the volume, let me go back to that particular slide. See here, this calcium hydroxide, the unreacted lime used to get react with water and it is to give rise to calcium hydroxide, right? And as a result of this calcium hydroxide, there was a change in the volume and this change in the volume used to uh, lead to cracking and there was unsoundness and disintegration. But here, it, here what will happen if you put more and more silica, it will not give any unsoundness like, like it is to give in the lime. And also no compounds of silica will react with water. That means if you ask, if you are putting more and more silica, this silica compound will not react with water like it is to do with the calc lime. So that is the one advantage. If you put more access of, uh, you know, uh, silica, there won't be volume change in the cement. Yeah. Now coming to the third point, that is the alumina. What will happen? Yeah. So the alumina components are responsible for the quick setting properties of the cement. Again, we should remember the alumina compound should be in between three to 8%. Now, again, the same question, what happens if you're putting more and more alumina? So if you're putting more and more alumina, it reduces the clinkering temperature because the alumina will act as a flux and makes the cement weaker, right? Actually, what happens during the manufacturing of the cement, you require a huge temperature. That means your temperature should be in between 1,400 to 1,500, 1,600 degrees Celsius. So that much amount of temperature is required when you want to do the production of the cement. But if you ask if, but if you're adding more and more alumina, this alumina will act as a flux and whatever temperature that you're supposed to get, that is around 1400 to 1600, that won't be achieved due to access of alumina. So this alumina will act as a flux, right? So that is why if you are uh, adding more and more alumina, uh, the access of that will uh, act, as a, act as a flux and makes the cement weaker. Now the question is that, what is that clinkering temperature? What I explained. So it's a temperature at which the clinker formation takes place. Because if you want to manufacture the cement, the clinkers are going to form. I'll show you the image of how the uh, clinkers are gonna form. And these clinkers, what you're going to, what they're going to form, they're formed at a very high temperature, right? So we'll try to see that. See, this is how the clinkers are formed. These are cement itself, but later you have to do the crushing of that. And only then you're going to get it in the form of a powder. So this clinker, what you can see, you know, the red hot one, uh, it, this, these things are usually formed at a 1400 to 1600 temperature, right? So uh, if you don't uh, take the temperature up to this level, then the clinker formation will not happen, right? And also the cement, what you're going to 
get that will be of weaker cement so that is why alumina cement that, that is why uh, sorry that is why alumina content should be in between 3 to 8 percent yeah now coming to the next next is the iron oxide so what iron oxide will does again the iron oxide percentage should be in between 0.5 to 6 percent first thing is that the iron oxide himself will not do anything it is actually acting like a catalyst or it helps in fusing of lime and silica because we have seen lime and silica that both give the strength, the soundness to the cement, right? So this iron oxide will actually help in fusing the lime and silica and as a result of that, the products are going to be formed. So iron oxide himself is not going to do anything. The second is that, hence it will indirectly help in getting the strength and hardness to the cement, right? Because of the lime and silica, it's going to do the fusing of that. Indirectly, it's going to give the strength but that is that strength will become that strength will come due to lime and silica. The third point is that the iron oxide has no active role, but make the reaction of the lime and silica. This is the same thing what we have seen. The fourth and the important thing what the iron oxide does is that it provides the color to the cement. So if you have seen the cement, this is a gray color, right? It's a gray in color. So the gray color of the cement is actually due to the iron oxide. Now the question that comes in our mind, that means the main thing that is responsible for the color is the iron oxide. Now let us say I want to prepare a white cement, right? Usually white cement we try to make use of wherever we want to give a very white color and all. So in that case, we try to go with the white cement. So since this is white in color, I don't want any other color to come into the cement. That means what I need to do whenever I want a white cement, I need to play with the iron oxide content. So in the white cement production, or in the production of the white cement, the proportion of the iron oxide is reduced significantly. If you're reducing the contents or if you're reducing the, if you're reducing the proportion of uh, iron oxide, then what we are going to get is the white cement, right? So in this way, this iron oxide is going to help us. Now, the, the fourth uh, is that about the magnesia. So this magnesia has the same properties like the iron oxide, right? Whatever properties we have seen for the iron oxide, the magnesia also has the same property. The only the thing is that you should look into the proportion of that. The magnesia should be kept in, in a proportion of one to 3%. Second is that it also provides color to the cement. Now, like in the lime, what used to happen, whatever excess of lime we had, no, see excess of magnesia will make the cement unsound. That means whenever we had excess of lime, what used to happen again, the lime used to get react with water as a result of that calcium hydroxide used to form in the same way if you're putting more and more magnesia that is if you're putting more than three percent of magnesia again this magnesia will react with water and as a result of that magnesium hydroxide will form and again heat is evolved again this magnesia hydroxide what is formed it will increase the volume of a cement so i don't want that to happen so that is the reason i try to limit my magnesia content between one to three percent but one thing we need to understand, whatever magnesium hydroxide that is going to form, it will be actually happening at very high temperature and in an extreme condition. So in the normal case, you are not going to get this reaction because it requires huge high temperature and all. Whereas calcium hydroxide will react with water. This doesn't require extreme condition. The moment your lime is more, it will react with water. But whereas in magnesia, that will not happen since it requires some extreme condition. Now coming to the sulfates, the sulfate should be up to 3%. Like you can see again, the limit, again, the percentage of the sulfate should be in between one to 3%. Now the question is that what will happen if my sulfates are more than 3%, right? Now let us say uh, you have taken a cement and in that you have found that the sulfate content is more than 3%. Let us say it is somewhere close to 4%. So in that case, what is going to happen? So whatever excess sulfate you have, no, that will react with C3A. These are actually lime and alumina compound. And once they start to react with this, it's going to form calcium sulfoaluminate. And again, this calcium sulfoaluminate, what is formed, it will again result in the more volume. That is almost 227% of volume increase is going to happen. That is the volume is going to increase. increase. Now, even if the volume increases, we don't have issue with that. But what it will try to do, it will try to crack your cement that is a cracking is going to happen. And this particular phenomena, what is going to happen is called a sulfate attack, right? This particular thing, what is going to happen is called a sulfate attack. And if sulfate hat attack happens again, what will happen? The durability of my concrete is going to come down. The durability of my structure is going to come down. So I don't want that to happen. 
that is the reason i try to limit my percentage of the sulfate in between 1 to 3% now whatever i have explained so far that is called as internal sulfate attack that means i'll write it here it is called as internal sulfate attack that means i know that if the percentage is more than 3% only then this uh, sulfate attack is going to happen right so what i am supposed to do instead of keeping this percentage more than 3% i have to reduce the percent that means this so3 content what i have no this i need to keep it less than 3% so only then what will happen the sulfate sulfate attack is not going to happen good but let us say whenever we put up a concrete and whenever there is a sewer lines passing by i'll show it here so this is a sewer line what is passing by and due to this uh, sewage and all what will happen As so4 gases are evolved and again this sulfate gases are evolved what will happen since again this is a sulfate this again reacts with my concrete and again what will happen the sulfate attack is going to happen that means it's the same reaction see first what i did i knew that if my sulfate content is more it's going to lead to the sulfate attack so what i did i reduced this sulfate content in my cement that is okay but when I, but when i went for the construction site and when i wanted to do the concreting of this and what happened due to the sulfate that is present inside the water this hydrogen sulfide gases are evolved again this gases will react with the concrete and again what is going to happen the sulfate attack is going to happen but this time the sulfate attack is external sulfate attack so even though i reduce my percentage of sulfate in my cement i i couldn't stop this because this is coming from external sources of the water right so this is called as external sulfate attack now what is the option that i have so the next option what i have is that instead of reducing this sulfate content so3 i need to reduce this c3a because because this sulfate is trying to react with c3a that is lime and alumina compound and as a result of that my uh, calcium sulfur aluminate is taking place and the sulfate attack is happening that means if internally i want to stop this sulfate attack then i need to reduce my sulfate content but if it is happening due to external sources like we saw it here in the sewage pipes and all in that case not only by reducing the sulfate content we can stop this uh, sulfate attack we have to even stop we have, we have to even lessen this uh, c3a content also so during the manufacturing of the cement when we try to see the different types of cement in that case we'll try to see how we can prepare a sulfate resisting cement by reducing this c3a content as of now it's only under it's only enough for us to understand that sulfates should be in between 1 to 3% and if it is more then what will happen it will give rise to this calcium sulfur aluminate which uh, results into cracking and it is called as sulfate attack yeah and the last thing that that is there in our cement is the alkalis so alkalis we actually don't put it in the cement but by nature that is by due to the raw materials and all they actually come into the my cement now we don't have issue if there is alkalis in the cement but the thing is that the percentage of the alkalis should be less than 1% right as far as possible we should make sure the alkalis percentage are less than 1% there are different tests for all these things where we can check the percentage of the alkalis so what now the question is that what will happen if my alkalis percentage are more than 1% let us say there is 2% of alkali in my cement so the access will result in the straining or the white patches on the surface of the cement and this straining or the white patches what you can see on the cement right you can see it here see all these are the white patches and all so these things are called as efflorescence now the question comes in my mind what is this efflorescence so efflorescence is a crystalline or a powder deposit of salts often visible on the surface of the concrete brick stucco or natural stone surfaces this occurs when water leaves behind the salt deposit on the any of the surface right so as far as possible you should try to keep the alkalis within the 1% so that you don't find this type of phenomena called as efflorescence happening right so this were the different ingredients that was required in the cement in the next lecture we'll try to see how the manufacturing of the cement is happened how the clinkering temperature is attained how the clinkers are formed and all those things we'll try to see in the next lecture so far our discussion was only limited to the different ingredients that is present in the cement how it has to be kept in the proportion lime how much it has to be kept silica how much it has to be kept alumina how much it has to be kept and also we saw the importance what actually those uh, lime silica is going to do to my cement how the strength is achieved and also we saw that what will happen if there is excess amount of that and also if there is a less amount of that so keeping all these things in the mind 
in the next lecture we'll try to see how the manufacturing of cement is going to happen and what we are going to do just in case if this percentage what we have is lesser in number and how we try to counteract all these things so in the next lecture we'll try to understand all these things so we'll see you back in the next lecture thank you